Hello and welcome to this latest Lowy Institute live event. This is part of what we're calling the Long Distance Lowy Institute, in which we communicate our content and analysis online while we're unable to do it in person. Today we have people joining us from all over the world, from Tokyo and Singapore to, and Manila. We also have several of our board members and corporate members on the call. A warm welcome to you all. My name is Michael Fullylove and I'm the Executive Director of the Lowy Institute. And joining me this morning from Washington DC are two of the most influential voices in the American debate on the world, Kurt Campbell and Michelle Flournoy. Kurt served as the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs in the Obama administration, where he was a key architect of Washington's pivot to Asia under President Obama and Secretary Hillary Clinton. He's one of the leading Asia experts in the United States, a former think tanker as the senior VP at CSIS and an entrepreneur as the founding chairman of the Asia Group. From our narrow perspective, he's also a great friend of Australia's, a counsellor to successive Australian prime ministers and an officer of the Order of Australia. Most importantly of all, of course, in 2013, Kurt served as the Lowy Institute's inaugural Distinguished International Fellow. Welcome, Kurt. Michelle Flournoy is another remarkable policymaker. Michelle served as the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy in the Obama administration from 2009 to 2012. Her portfolio there include, met, included many vexing international challenges, including engineering the drawdown of US troops from Afghanistan. At the time of her appointment, Michelle was the highest ranking woman in Pentagon history. In 2017, when President Donald Trump appointed Jim Mattis to serve as his defense secretary, Mattis wanted Michelle to come on board as his deputy. According to reporting, Michelle, well, we know she didn't take up that opportunity. And if you don't mind my saying, Michelle, the further we get along, the wiser that decision looks. Michelle is now the co-founder and managing partner of West Exec Advisors. Kurt and Michelle have been collaborators and partners in crime for a long time. In 2007, they co-founded the Center for a New American Security, one of the most energetic and effective think tanks in Washington. Both of them also are known for mentoring many of the best and brightest minds in Washington. I really could not be more delighted to have both of you with me, so welcome. Thanks, Thanks Michael. Michael. Great to be with you. Now, before I go to my guests, just some quick housekeeping. On the base of your screens, you'll see a Q&A button where you can submit questions to Kurt and Michelle. We'll put as many of your questions to them both as we can later in the discussion. But first, I have some of my own questions for the panelists, so I'm going to kick off. Let me ask you both, uh, and maybe I'll start with you, Kurt. Let me ask you to reflect on what's happening on the streets of America. We've seen in the last couple of weeks the killing of George Floyd, the protests which followed that, and the response of the Trump administration. Uh, let me say, for my, um, for my, in my case, many friends of America are heartsick at what we are seeing, and we extend our, 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 our thoughts to you. So, can I ask you to reflect on what is happening on the streets of America at the moment? Uh, Michael, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you so much for inviting uh, me and Michelle to be uh, in your group today. Uh, it's great to be back at the Lowy Institute, at least virtually, and I appreciate the question. Um, it's a hard one for Americans, frankly. I think there are elements of what's uh, taken place over the last couple of weeks and the last couple of months, which are just deeply discouraging. But like in all things that transpire that are tragic in the United States, there are often hopeful notes, and you will note over the last several days uh, a number of elements of grace and uh, hopefulness have played out, peaceful demonstrations across the United States, a broad recognition of uh, violence against African Americans, uh, not just in recent days, but historically, a, a real sense of a community uh, being wronged a recognition that remedy uh, is necessary and a broad political recognition that this is something that requires a, a profound national effort that goes beyond policing. But let's remember, Michael, this takes place not just in the context of the racial, racial situation, the, the, the initial sin of the United States, 
uh, slavery and then the the persistence of of racial insens insensitivity and and discrimination historically but we've also lived through um, by far and away the worst elements of uh, the coronavirus challenge and an economic plummet that is you know reminiscent of the Great Depression and so uh, if you live in Washington DC and you're you know not terribly comfortable with the Trump administration and you add these three things in it can be deeply discouraging and for me personally I'm living with a bunch of my daughters and their friends and they are insisting every day to go out and to um, and to uh, represent and to peacefully demonstrate and you know you have to let them you have to support them but there isn't a day that I'm not nervous because we've got armed groups uh, in the streets military we've got helicopters uh, 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 overhead I, I never thought I'd see this in my own country and uh, some days it feels like a bad dream, but ultimately I, I'm hopeful that we'll pull through and be stronger as a result. That's not a good answer. I recognize, Michael, but it's just such a difficult thing for many of us to comprehend and wrap our heads around. Michelle, let me ask you, let me take up where Kurt finished on the role of the military over the past mm -hmm. fortnight. We've seen those helicopters flying low. But we've also seen the appearance of, of police officers and soldiers in the streets without identifying ranks. We saw General Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in combat fatigues in Lafayette Square. We saw, we heard those remarks by the Defence Secretary Mark Esper, which is now withdrawn, where he recommended that governors dealing with the protests should seek to dominate the battle space. As someone who, who has spent a lot of her career in the Pentagon, um, how do how do those things how does how does it feel to see those sorts of things those signs on America's streets? I think anyone who's taken an oath to the Constitution, which is something you do when you take public office in the United States, um, was horrified by what we saw last Monday evening. Um, it really was a situation where we had the president talking about deploying active duty troops, not just National Guard on the streets. We had an influx of both National Guard and federal law enforcement of all different stripes. Um, and then we had a very aggressive use of force um, before the curfew was imposed. So when people were just there peacefully protesting, exercising their First Amendment rights, major use of force to clear out the area using tear gas, pepper spray, rubber bullets, uh, flashbang grenades, the low flying helicopters, um, to basically clear a path for the president to stroll through Lafayette Park next to the White House and have a photo op in front of an historic church. Um, so people were aghast, they were appalled. Um, I think that um, for, for the, the Defense Department leadership, Behind the scenes, the good news is that both Secretary Esper and General Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, were advising Trump against invoking the uh, Insurrection Act. That's saying you don't need to do that. The National Guard is adequate. Law enforcement is adequate. But as you said, they did make some mistakes talking about dominating the battle space as if we were in a combat zone overseas in Iraq or Afghanistan. General Milley being caught, you know, in his battle fatigues, walking behind the president, you know, in the wake of this use of for, inappropriate use of force. But I do think it, that moment was so horrifying to so many people that several things happened. One is you had a lot of senior military officers who'd held their tongues out of respect for the office of the president, finally step up and speak out. Mm -hmm. Chairman Mullen, Admiral Mullen, General Mattis, mm -hmm. um, and General Dempsey, others. And they were uniform that, you know, we should not use the military in a way that would violate constitutional rights of Americans, that would politicize the institution, it would break, break trust in the institution and so forth. And then in the days following, you saw a real pulling back of troops being redeployed home, National Guard troops no longer having any arms, you know, people being pulled back. So we kind of came up to the brink of a really terrifying moment and it was so terrifying and so many people spoke up. I was part of a letter of 89 former senior defense officials, Kurt II, that said this is wrong and we must not do this. And then we seem to have stepped back from the brink in recent days. All right, Kurt, let me ask you about 
the last crisis that America has dealt with, you referred to it, COVID, um, because as you say, that's the backdrop against which uh, some of these events in the past fortnight have taken place. How, what should we make of America's response to COVID? You have 110,000 dead. Um, we are used to seeing your country as the epicenter of global power, not as the epicenter of global disease. Now, we can point to President Trump's missteps, but uh, it does seem that, that perhaps COVID has functioned as a stress test for America and has shown up some other weaknesses in your society. Is that, is that fair? Um, how can America turn, take some positives uh, out of the experience in COVID to become a stronger country? Yeah, thanks, Michael. It's a good question. I, I would just simply say uh, a leading nation in a time like this, uh, the leading nation, would be expected to do three things and three things relatively effectively. First is to deal with the domestic challenge that COVID provided with a degree of, of capacity, capability, and organization. And you'd want that, that effort to demonstrate the seriousness of the cause, organize a, a unified front across the board, combining medical, other national capacities to deal with it. Second, you would want the United States to be able to provide goods, goods and capabilities, PPE, to allies and friends globally that are struggling, and not just in Asia and Europe, but through the developing world. And third, you would expect the United States to try to take a leadership role to convene international organizations and groups, the G7, the G20, the WHA, to basically make sure that the global community was working together. And there is such a thing as the global community that is working together to address the worst manifestations of the crisis. And I think what's troubling for many of us is that the United States has fallen badly down on all three counts. We've clearly uh, made a hash of it domestically. We've been unable to provide global goods. In fact, if anything, we're out trying to outbid other countries to provide uh, capacity that we bring back home. And we've basically shunned international groupings and organizations. Now, it's clear that China's made a lot of errors and a lot of mistakes, but they've played more of a role recently to try to provide global goods and support in a way that the United States previously had. And I'm not saying China's surging to take over the U.S. role, but basically we have largely been absent on duty from our traditional role, and you see it most clearly at places like uh, meetings at the WHA, and efforts in the G7. I, I would say, look, this crisis would be dramatic for any leadership. And you're seeing it play out in Germany and Great Britain and across Europe. It's posed an enormous challenge to a number of uh, countries. And you've seen some winners, New Zealand, Australia's I think had some, uh, some success, Japan uh, at, at times, South Korea, Taiwan. Um, it reveals that countries that have not made profound and deep commitments to social wel welfare, to uh, public health systems, who have not uh, thought about creating uh, capacities for a crisis, who don't respect science or medical doctors. I mean, you get what you get. And uh, I am troubled. I think, I think this would have been difficult for anyone, but I am certain that President Trump and his team have made it worse. And we're still not through this. And if you look at our, our only real guide, Michael, is the flu epidemic of 1917, 1918. If you go out in the United States today, in Washington and most places, it would feel, except for the masks, that we've returned to business as usual. But in fact, the, the virus is spreading in many parts of the United States. And I think people expect that there will be a substantial second wave in uh, the fall or early winter if there is not a vaccine that has been applied uh, to the uh, greater population. So generally speaking, we're in the midst of this. So we're in the midst of an economic crisis, a crisis of, of, of uh, racial issues inside the United States and the coronavirus we're midstream. We're, we're in the, like, 
we use baseball analogies, we're like in the second or third inning. We've got lots to play here and we are behind. And I think, frankly, not taking it nearly seriously as we should. All right, speaking of the fall, um, let me move on to the election in November because the United States has an opportunity. We've spoken a bit about President Trump's leadership. The United States has an opportunity as a democracy to course correct in November. Both, both of you have endorsed uh, Vice President Joe Biden as uh, for President of the United States. Perhaps I can start with you, Michelle. How would um, President, what, what would it mean for US foreign policy if, President, if Vice President Biden is elected president? How would his foreign policy differ from President Trump's? And secondly, what would it mean for America and the world if President Trump is re-elected? If Americans look at the last four years and effectively say, more please. Well, um, I, I do think that if Vice President Biden is elected, you will see a more recognizable America. Um, he threw, you know, this is someone who's spent his career in foreign policy. He understands the importance of U.S. engagement in the, war, in the world. He understands the strategic value and advantage of our deep uh, network of alliances around the world. Um, uh, and he understands that had the importance of the U.S being a model to emulate the sort of the, the power of our soft power to be an example. And he's talked about this a lot. So, you know, I'm not saying you would, I don't think you'd see a turning back of the clock because the world has changed. We're in a much more multipolar world, a much more competitive world, the world of these, you know, simultaneous crises, a world of technology disruption, uh, a world of advancing climate change. So it's not turning back the clock, but I do think you would see someone who would try to restore a modicum of US leadership, starting by reinvesting in and reinvigorating and adapting our alliances um, and our partnerships around the world. Um, you know, I personally think it's hard for me to let myself imagine <laughs> what it will mean if Trump is reelected because four years of this has done some real damage and it's gonna take many, many more years than that to, reco to recover from it. And some of it will never fully recover from. If you were to extend that to eight years of the kind of treatment uh, of our allies, the cozying up to authoritarian regimes, the lack of leadership here at home to heal the kind of societal divisions that need to be healed, to invest in the drivers of American competitiveness for the future, um, to really um, have a strategic approach to our foreign policy. You know, if that becomes eight years, I think Amer then I think Amer we lose our position. We lose our economic, much a good portion of our ec economic competitiveness um, and, and many other things. I, I j it's hard for me to imagine the extent of the damage if this became a two-term administration. I also have the question of who would actually populate it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, in the sense that there's so many open seats now, there's so many mm -hmm. um, people, jobs that are unfilled. Um, and you know, I'm not sure where the bench is for four more years of this. Kurt, let me give you an opportunity to answer the same questions. What, would, what, would it, what are the stakes in this election? What would it mean if President Trump is reelected? And then I guess to finish on a positive, if Vice President Biden is elected, what are the possibilities for, for an American snapback? Yeah, thanks, Michael. And I, I, let me just uh, begin by saying I really um, admire and agree with what Michelle has said, and I agree with it wholeheartedly. Um, I, I, my sense is that many people globally believe that in some respects, the election of President Trump was a kind of accident that, you know, we uh, didn't have a strong competing uh, candidate, that the elite had not listened carefully, that there was a sense of, of uh, outrage in parts of the country, and that this was a reaction to, um, uh, you know, a ways of doing business over decades. I, I don't actually agree with that storyline, but it is a it is one that is a broadly accepted in many parts of the United States and the world. I think if he is reelected, I think then it goes from 
well, this was some sort of historic accident and Americans have learned from it to a, um, a view that both President Trump and importantly, the Republican Party has accepted so many things that we would have thought impossible, you know, authoritarian impulses, just, you know, when, when Michelle was talking about the military, think about, you know, there are the power ministries in our country, the FBI, the Justice Department, and the military. The first two of those are showing real signs of weakness under enormous pressure from the president and some of the people under him. And I will say this idea that you cannot find people, I disagree with that. You always can find people who are prepared to serve, you know, with, when power comes uh, with the opportunity. Uh, it's just the character of those people you really start to have questions and concerns about. And so I'm like Michelle, I think, I think what it will say about the United States and about the world is enormous and concerning. I, like, look at all the things that we've been talking about. What has gotten barely a mention, Michael, in the last week, President Trump has announced we're going to pull out a third of our troops from Germany, right? And, and there's lots of strategic discussion about why, but we know why. It's because uh, Merkel decided not to come to the G7 for health reasons in the United States, and that bothered the president. And so this is really the kind of decision that, uh, that he might take. I could easily see him taking decisions in Asia that are deeply concerning bizarre overtures to North Korea, pulling our troops out of South Korea, a very different set of interactions with a number of countries that could verge on um, creating a conflict. I, I, I worry about all of those things. I think what, what President Biden, what Vice President Biden um, holds uh, open as a possibility is although the world has changed very much, I agree that it will be more recognizable. There will be restorative uh, elements associated with this, but at the same time, we cannot, we can't, Michelle and I cannot under, uh, underscore enough how difficult the circumstances will be. The national coffers will, will be uh, emptied. We will uh, be uh, largely exhausted from uh, both Trump and the coronavirus. We will be digging out of unemployment uh, difficulties for years. But at the same time, I will say this, Michael, the one recurring theme over decades of, of commentary in Asia has been the belief about American decline. Uh, during the Korean War, Vietnam War, at the end of the, uh, the Cold War, the sense that Japan had won, the Asian financial crisis, more recently in the global economic crisis, each time when the United States was counted out, we came surging back because of our uh, residual capacities, our capabilities, our ability to reinvent ourselves. And so I do believe the United States has those capacities. I will say what has to be part of the equation going forward is a degree of American humility. If Vice President Biden is elected president, I would expect he and his colleagues, people around him to listen and to be deeply humble about what's just gone on and to work clearly and constructively, particularly with our allies. I can imagine a situation where that the number one agenda of the United States is to work closely with our allies and as part of that effort, to again elevate our virtues of our, uh, our, our beliefs, our support for democracy and human rights. All of those issues have been largely overlooked or forgotten in recent years. I think the vice president feels those deeply and I believe those will be part of any approach uh, if uh, Vice President Biden is elected in November. All right, thank you. Let me stay with you, Kurt, for the next question too, and ask you about US-China relations and how you think they would change under a Vice President Biden. I mean, my sense is that for the first couple of years, first two or three years, President Trump wasn't tough on China per se, he was tough on trade, and he was tough on China trade. Now he is zeroing in on China as he gets desperate about re-election and it, perhaps he feels it has some domestic leverage. We've seen um, him criticize uh, Vice President Biden for being soft on China, and we've seen Vice President Biden return fire and put out an ad saying, actually, it's actually, you're the poodle. Actually, you're the one who's soft on China. 
what does all this add up to? What would a US strategy towards China look like under Vice President Biden? How would it be different from Obama's yeah. strategy on China? How would it be different from Trump's? So look, I think we have to acknowledge that the world has changed. We have a different leadership in Beijing, a leadership that's more assertive, that's more risk acceptant, that is more aggressive in a number of circumstances with friends, with allies on issues of deep national purpose and concern of the United States. And so I believe uh, Vice President Biden has no illusions about China understands the nature of the challenge that they pose. And I believe that the watchword for relations between Beijing and Washington will be competition. We're gonna compete um, and the hope will be that that competition will be peaceful. We're going to try to align a number of countries to make clear what we expect from uh, Beijing in terms of international um, performance and, and standards across the board on trade, on human rights. Uh, I, I believe a, a natural arena for closer coordination with Europe, with Australia, with Japan, with India, Vietnam, and other countries really is to coordinate more effectively on China. At the same time that I think relations will be difficult and challenging, I believe uh, Vice President Biden and his team understand that there are some issues that require a degree of alignment, if not cooperation between the United States and China. The expectation has always been that, for instance, during the Cold War, when the United States and the Soviet Union had to work on smallpox together, they did. The hope would be that as we face the tail end of this coronavirus challenge that the United States and China would find arenas where we'd be able to work together. I think that's necessary and it's in our national interest. I believe that to prevent the further proliferation of nuclear materials and weapons, a degree of cooperation is necessary. A certain degree of macroeconomic coordination or alignment is useful for both nations and in the interest of the United States. And again, as has been mentioned, if we cannot work or at least again align with Beijing and with India and other leading powers on climate change, it will be difficult to deal with this most difficult 21st century problem. And so I just don't think it's viable to think about moving into a situation in which you're in all out confrontation with China. It's not in our interests. Um, although I will say it is not completely up to us. We have to be clear, we've got to give the Chinese an opportunity to work with us, but we have to be vigilant about the things that we uh, believe in and that we want to defend. I do believe if we're able to align our allies and work closely, we can present a kind of uh, ultimatum to China about what we expect in terms of their performance and their activity on the global stage. Michelle, let me give you an opportunity to chime in on China too. China is, as you know, is, is a matter of abiding interest here in Australia. So we'd be interested to hear about your view on Biden's pol policy towards China, but also on climate change, if you wouldn't mind. President Trump took your country out of the Paris Accord. Vice President Biden has said that he would rejoin Paris on day one. What else would a Biden administration do to return the United States to a position of climate leadership? Well, first on China, I think, you know, you've heard Vice President Biden has talked a lot about step number one is reinvesting in the drivers of our own competitiveness here at home, whether that's science and technology, research and development, 21st century infrastructure, access to higher education, a smart immigration policy that actually attracts the best and brightest from around the world and then tries to keep them here to grow their businesses here. So there's, I mean, and that actually coincides very nicely with some of the economic recovery agenda that we need to go after in this, in the wake of this crisis as well. So I think the first part is, you know, investing here at home to regain our resilience and our strength. Um, I also think that um, there's, there would be a fair amount of focus um, on refining um, the importance of deterrence. Um, the whole point of this is, you know, on the military and security dimension is to prevent conflict, uh, prevent um, 
any kind of miscalculation that would get two nuclear powers into conflict. And I think there are some very specific steps that could be taken to sharpen our edge, to clarify our interests and communicate both our resolve and our capabilities more clearly to Beijing. But I believe that all of this would be done in the context of a strategy and a strategic dialogue. I mean, one of the challenges for, with the Trump administration is they may have diagnosed some of the problems with China on China trade correctly, but they've really only consistently looked to use two instruments, tariffs um, and, um, and threats. Um, and you know, coercive instruments. I, as Kurt said, this is going to be a much more complex and comprehensive agenda where we're going to be pushing back where we need to, but also engaging China to try to communicate where our interests and values lie, where we have differences that they need to be mindful of, where we have areas where we need to work together. So on climate change, I do think, um, I do hope that we would immediately come back into the Paris Accord. But that's not going to be enough because the time has been ticking, the clock, you know, the clock is ticking, um, and we're going to need to um, adopt a more rigorous set of uh, goals. I do believe that um, a Biden administration would use um, federal incentives to try to stimulate more sustainable sources of energy, adoption of electrification in terms of transportation, a whole set of practices that would accelerate the movement of the US economy um, down the road towards a lower carbon footprint. One of the things that I've found heartening is you see a lot of corporations that are making their own commitments to go to zero or negative carbon footprint. That's happening anyway. Um, governors are still leading, big city mayors are still leading, CEOs are still leading. So all that energy is there to be brought together under a new administration. And lastly, I just note, I think the Pentagon is a, is a huge demonstration platform. The military as the military understands this threat. They understand what climate change will mean for them. For goodness sake, if you look at most of our coastal bases, they will be underwater at some point. So, you know, there's a lot of interest in the Pentagon if they were allowed to lean forward on this issue. So I think you'd see a very active agenda in this area. All right, I'm gonna to go to questions from the audience here. We've, we've got very enthusiastic uh, audience members for this particular event. I'm gonna to try to get through as many questions as I can. Um, and I'll read the questions out to Kurt and Michelle as I see them. Uh, I'm gonna start with really for either of you, this is a question from Steve Rowan Jones, who's the director of O2C. Steve says, we hear and see a lot of the negatives of the Trump administration. What are three positive outcomes generated by Trump? I'll, I'll jump in. I, I, Michelle probably has her list as well, but I'll give you a few things. It, it is generally the case of almost every administration that comes into power. They tend to look back and discard, or at least initially, certain elements of the previous administration. And that's something you have to be very careful about. So I would say, number one, Michael, I admire that with some of our uh, relationships between President Trump and his counterparts, he has forged deeply personal relationships that transcend just the you know, exchange of diplomatic niceties. And so he's, he has found the time to golf and to have supper with Prime Minister Abe, with a succession of Australian leaders. Uh, he takes personal diplomacy seriously. And it turns out that in today's day and age, that matters. And uh, I admired and enjoyed very much uh, working for uh, President Obama. I was in a lot of meetings with him. He was, uh, we have a saying, he was cooler than the other, than the other side of the pillow. Mm -hmm. uh, and occasionally a little aloof, and I could sense that some of the his counterparts wanted more, wanted to have a little bit more of a relationship. And I think Vice President Biden is a deeply engaging person, and that is one of his strengths. So I'm hopeful that some of that, particularly in Asia, will be replicated. That would be number one. Number two, I, I like the way Michelle put it. I, I don't agree with the way that President Trump has gone about it, but he has tried to link domestic politics and the domestic pursuits 
of Americans with our international purpose more directly. And I think he's argued that in some ways international relations or international diplomacy is somehow um, disconnected from how Americans live and our various walks of life. And I think that's something is a reminder to all of us. You can have a foreign policy that in some ways doesn't address the needs of the American middle class and uh, uh, American um, uh, uh, people by and large. And I think he has at least uh, in his crude way attempted to address that issue. And the third thing is that in some instances he has been audacious. Uh, he decided that he was going to sit down with Kim Jong-un and try to see what's possible going forward. Now, the truth is, I think an American Democratic leader would have tried that before, except for what would have been a cascading howls of disapproval from the Republican Party. And of course, under President Trump, you're not going to hear anything. But I do think that there are some things that he has asked the question, why not? And, uh, you know, sometimes nice diplomatic niceties, we've never done it this way, way before, tend to pervade and prevail in discussions about diplomacy. And the fact that he's challenged some of those beliefs, I think is healthy. So you could take that back. Those are three things that I think we should watch and, and, and consider carefully. Thank you, Michael. All right, Michelle, do you want to add something on that question? Yeah, I'm not sure I can get to all the way to three, but um, right. let me add a couple. Yeah. <laughs> One is, you recall, after the financial crisis, the Congress imposed something called the Budget Control Act, which severely reduced and constrained military spending. As a result of that, uh, we really had a self-imposed or self-created readiness crisis across the services. Um, and I do think that the Trump administration's increase of defense spending, al although I don't think in general it's been as wisely applied as it might have been, it ha they have presided with the Congress and the end of sequestration over a recovery of readiness that needed to occur. So I'll give them partial credit for you know, having that happen on their watch. And then the second thing is, is I do think there are a number of areas, as much as um, Trump has uh, been uh, challenging for some of our close allies in, in Europe, um, and in Asia, uh, you know, much of our our day-to-day -day alliance practices and cooperation have been allowed to proceed relatively untouched. So in Europe, you still have a tremendous initiative called the Deterrence and Reassurance Initiative that's really enhanced deterrence of Russia in the Baltic region and the frontline states um, in Northern Europe. Um, you know, in, in Asia, you see a much more routine use of freedom of navigation operations and a sort of effort to enforce the rules of the road with China alongside our allies like Australia and others. So I guess I'm trying to give him credit for not disturbing some of the things that have been working below the level of attention that the White House has, uh, you know, typically below what they've focused on. They have right. those things. That's the physician's rule, first do no harm. Exactly. Um, the next question I think is for probably best directed to Kurt, and it's from Gordon Flake from the US Asia Centre in Perth. Kurt says, can you discuss the implications for Australia of the very difficult and very public debate over cost sharing between the US and its treaty ally, the Republic of Korea? Yeah, thank you. I, I think this got, I, I raised it a little bit, and it's great to hear from my friend in Perth. Um, I, I, you know, what the president has done is put down a marker of just dramatic increases of host station support in both uh, South Korea and Japan. And I will tell you that one of the most difficult things a country can do is to host or send its forces to be deployed on the soil of another democratic nation. It's incredibly difficult, very complex politics. And I, I think it has created a near crisis in relations with both Seoul and it's not as apparent, but also in Tokyo as well. 
Now, what's not clear is, is the president trying to really up that price, like to get more money, to see us as, you know, being paid for by these other countries? Or is his ultimate intent to pull American forces out of Asia? I think there is some element of the latter. I, I think we, we now know from a variety of biographies that uh, who you know written about this period that he on several occasions has tried to pull forces out of South Korea. Secretary Mattis blocked it at one point. Others have you know misplaced paperwork and or just not followed through. But it's most concerning. And what is most concerning about this? Re remember what President Trump does does not happen in a vacuum. What is remarkable is how he has completely captured the heart and spirit of the Republican Party. You would think that there would be some Republicans that would raise concerns or questions about pulling U.S. forces out of Germany. I, I, I worry, again, to the question that was posed earlier, if President Trump is reelected and he decides to pull forces out, Will there be any counter group to say, no, that will, that will hurt American uh, purpose. It will, it will deter, uh, you know, for the kinds of uh, allied responses we'd like to see. So I would say what we're seeing playing out between the United States and South Korea is of deep, profound concern. And I think most countries in Asia are trying to defer and delay a variety of deliberations until after November with the hope that there will be a more predictable set of circumstances subsequently. All right. I think the next question I'll put to, to Michelle, and it's from Douglas Powell, um, whom I'm, I'm, I'm sure is the Doug Powell we know from the Carnegie Endowment. And Douglas asks this. He says, flirtation with the Insurrection Act reminds that there might be a troubled set of circumstances around our November election. Should the House and especially the Senate, the Senate summon America's military leaders to receive assurances in advance that they will protect the constitutional election processes? Michelle. You know, I, um, I do worry, um, given all the times that the president has talked about the potential for fraud, rigged elections, um, the fact that he's been asked point blank on national television whether if he loses the election, will he give up the office? I, you know, I don't think it's likely that he will, uh, this scenario will play out, but it's not, it's for the first time in our history, I think, not impossible to imagine a situation where Trump would contest the results. It would create a real crisis um, that would call into question, you know, if he doesn't, what happens if he refuses to leave? Um, my own view is you don't have to ask the U.S. military what they would do because they're going, what they will do is recite, you know, uh, chapter and verse of the Constitution and they will follow the ruling of the Supreme Court. I mean, this will be, if this happens, it'll be some combination of the chaos of the Iowa caucuses that we had during the primaries and the chaos of the Gore-Bush um, elections. And in that case, the, 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 the issues will be brought to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court will have to rule. I think the real question is what federal law enforcement agency would enforce that long before you ever get to a question of the military. Um, what law enforcement agency would actually be in, enforce that if you had to, to get there? But I think, you know, I had, a, I had an interesting conversation in the last week after the use of force um, on Lafayette Square with a young, you know, relatively young battalion commander who said, you know, the military as an institution is apolitical. And we take that very, very seriously. It's part of the reason why you haven't seen more Office, active duty officers speak up and even retired officers speak up. There may be a lot of cultural Republicans or cons more conservative folks in the military, but when it comes to questions of the, the core survival of our democracy and questions core to the implementation of our constitutional, there is no question. They are trained and schooled again and again 
do, you will not execute an, an order that you believe to be illegal. And if you believe it's immoral, you have the right to resign and refuse. Um, so this is inculcated and it is very universal, very strongly held. So perhaps someone would like to invite them to confirm that in a hearing. I don't think it's even necessary. I think it's very, very clear where the officer corps would stand. All right, Kurt, the next question is for you, and it's from James Curran, who's a history professor, well-known well history professor at the University of Sydney. And he's challenging some comments you made earlier in the discussion. And he says this, Kurt, isn't that a contradiction? You've just said that the US is exhausted and staring down into empty coffers. But do, in, if, that's in, if that's the case, does it have the capacity, does it have the will can it afford it? How will it galvanize the public to do so? Is the American public up for the challenge, especially for the challenge of a long twilight struggle with China? So I guess the question is, given the constraints you've mentioned, um, will that not constrain the United States in, in bouncing back this time? Yeah, look, I, I think many of the uh, issues that are uh, uh, constraining us right now. Many of the issues that are bedeviling us can be effectively addressed with the kinds of national policies that we discussed earlier in the discussion that Michelle laid out. Um, I, I also believe that if you look at a number of times, again, just in the last few decades, uh, most of Asia believed at the end of the Vietnam War that the United States was utterly defeated, divided domestically, exhausted, unable to compete. Um, and uh, we saw some of the strongest performance in American history in the 1980s and 1990s. My deepest belief is that the United States does have the ability to reinvent itself, to surge forward. I, I still think that the coronavirus uh, tragedy could have a silver lining in the sense that some of the most inventive uh, parts of American society are devoted to biomedicine and to innovative uh, medical capabilities. And I do, do believe we have what it takes to provide the kind of cures uh, uh, and uh, vaccines that can make a difference uh, on the global stage. And I also believe that the United States uh, has much to be able uh, to share with respect to trying to convene a coalition of countries that will deal with and in many circumstances confront China. I, I, I think the challenge here is that uh, if Vice President Biden is reelected, is elected, I do not believe that there will be cheering in uh, on the global stage that somehow America is back. In fact, I think that the early stages of the diplomacy will be very difficult. But if the United States is persistent, is patient, uh, invests in the kinds of things that uh, Michelle and we've discussed throughout this discussion, in a very short period of time, the United States can rebound as we have on numerous occasions in our past. The tendency has always been to overestimate our contenders and under, underestimate the uh, reservoirs of American capacity, ingenuity, and our ability to research. All right, the next question I'll start, I might put it to you in the first instance anyway, Michelle. It's from Lucy Ryan, who's an assistant director at the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And she asks, what is the outlook for the US-China trade deal? And what will the United States do next on Hong Kong? Good questions. Um, you know, I, I do think that uh, despite the difficulty both sides have had implementing even phase one of the trade deal, that right before an election, I don't think Trump really wants to see it fail. So I think there will be some efforts continue to be made on both sides to salvage some elements of that and, and move it forward. Although obviously I think that it's harder for China to meet its commitments um, and you know, it won't be fully implemented. I think the, the phase two deal is completely off the table. 
Um, one of the things that this crisis has done, and particularly Trump's handling of the crisis and blaming of China, it has really accelerated the alienation um, and, the, de and the, 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 the decline of the relationship. So I don't have a lot of hope for any, uh, you know, more structurally focused or fundamental trade deal uh, following, following this one. Um, in terms of Hong Kong, you know, you've seen Secretary Pompeo basically say he can't, you know, the president can't certify um, that uh, the, the autonomous situation in, in Hong Kong at this point. But what the administration has yet to do is to really then explain what that, that means. And they could take this in a lot of different directions. Um, some of which would be primarily symbolic and others that could have very deep but, you know, economic consequences and ultra, ultimately, um, uh, you know, very punishing consequences for uh, both China, but particularly the people of Hong Kong. Um, so I, you know, I'm not an expert on these issues, but I think that um, we need to try to navigate this in a way that supports our democratic values and our desire to see the freedoms of Hong, the Hong Kong people protected, but doesn't make them the worst victim of whatever you know, sanctions or, or constraints are imposed. All right. Um, Kurt, the next question is for you. And uh, this is a question from James Crabtree at the Lee Kuan Yew School in Singapore. And James was formerly with the Financial Times and he's quoting an article of yours, so that's a nice compliment to you. James says this, in his foreign affairs essay last year, Kurt wrote, although much of the discussion on US-China competition focuses on its bilateral dimension, the US will ultimately need to embed its China strategy in a dense network of relationships and institutions in Asia. What should President Biden's early priorities be in this regard? Yeah, thank you. It's a good question. So, so look, the, the truth is we have always treated China policy as a kind of almost romantic, mystical, bilateral, secret diplomacy sitting in big chairs uh, and uh, deciding issues uh, in sort of a bipolar cohort. That, that period is over. And real uh, effective China policy is now a more effective Asia policy. And so what's required is not only robust bilateral diplomacy of the kind that Michelle has outlined, but also working much more closely with allies. And so I can, I can imagine a number of steps that we could take. I think convening a group of like-minded states carefully uh, to talk about common pursuits and common purpose. You could imagine the Quad, India, Australia, uh, uh, Japan, and the United States, but other countries are also expressing a desire for this kind of dialogue about shared purpose. I can imagine certain discussions taking place with Singapore, with Vietnam, other countries that desire a, uh, a, a fuller landscape of engagement more generally. Some of this will be informal, Michael. Some of it will be perhaps formalized in other settings. I'd like to see the G22 uh, have a more robust agenda. I think in the past, a number of states have worked uh, to undermine common purpose in a number of institutions. I'd like most of those institutions to reflect Asian realities. I think if you look at some of our legacy institutions, Europe is overrepresented. We need to recognize that there have to be institutions in which Asia plays a dominant role. I, I'd like to see the United States play a robust role in the ASEAN Regional Forum, in the East Asia Summit. These are all challenging things. It requires people getting on planes and flying for long distances. But this is what's going to be uh, at stake here, is a deep, fundamental American commitment. And so what we are likely to see, Michael, if we're going to take this seriously, Asia has always been a secondary theater for the United States. It was a secondary theater during the Second World War, during Vietnam. We were primarily focused on the primary theater in Europe with the Soviet Union. 
for the first time really in our history, both for economic issues, for security issues, uh, across the board for climate, the central convening regional and strategic orientation is going to be in Asia. And that's gonna mean building more capacity, spending more time, focusing intently and intensely on not just the bilateral diplomacy with, with uh, China, as we described, but also with these surrounding countries, most of whom, and again, this is perhaps another area that we can compliment President Trump. Most of these countries, Australia, uh, India, uh, uh, Japan, even South Korea are now more prepared to speak out and to step up and to engage in a collaborative process to talk about how uh, we want to work constructively with China than in the past. And the United States can and should take advantage of that. All right, I'm going to ask the final two questions and I'll start with you, Michelle. Let me pick up exactly where Kurt finished. Um, as you may have seen in the press, the, Australia, the Australian relationship with China has really hardened and cooled in recent months. It's happened over a probably over the course of a number of years, but especially in the last couple of months in response to Australia's call for an independent investigation into the coronavirus pandemic. The Chinese were very angry with us and they have imposed some tariffs, for example, on our barley exports. And there's been various talk of coercion and consumer boycotts. What, what advice would you give the Australian government, Michelle, on dealing with a country like China? Well, again, I think Kurt's formula is, is key, is that if we each try to deal with China bilaterally, we will be uh, much weaker in our dealings than if we approach China as states that share common interests and common values. Um, and so I think building out a coalition of free market democracies, of like-minded states who can approach China together when we have common concerns, um, I think that's the stronger way to go. Um, but I think, you know, China is always testing the limits. Um, and when we've succeeded in sort of making them take a step back from a more assertive or aggressive posture, it has been when we've approached them with some unified coalition of states that say, no, this is, this is not on. Of course, we are going to have a clear-eyed fact-based analysis of this pandemic and how it started. We're gonna do it in the United States, or we should. We should do it with regard to China's role. Everybody's well. we need to learn lessons from this so that it, when it happens again, we're gonna be better prepared to limit the consequences. Um, so that, that's where I would start. But I do think we shouldn't ask countries to choose between the US and China. We need to really fortify um, this coalition that Kurt started to describe of like-minded states to find out where is it in our interest to work together um, to engage China and also to push back when necessary. All right, Kurt, final question to you. What would a Biden administration mean for Australia? Now, the Australian public, as you know, doesn't much like Donald Trump, but Australian governments have done a reasonable job of getting on with him. And as you alluded to, Scott Morrison has developed a good relationship with President Trump. What would you, what would you, how would you assess the way the Australian government has, uh, has dealt with the Trump administration? And if, Pres if Vice President Biden were elected, how would, what would be your advice about remaining relevant and remaining central to, to his councils? Yeah, thanks, Michael. So look, the one of the, in my view, very positive elements of this period which is filled with upheaval and difficulty. And what makes this period different than the Cold War is that the maneuver room and influence of middle powers is greater than it's ever been. So countries like Australia, Great Britain, Germany, India, Japan have enormous influence, convening influence, maneuver room, defining purpose in the global community. And that, that should not be underestimated. And so Australia's role globally has never been more important and frankly, more recognized. So that's the first point I'd make. The second is uh, 
The most important thing about the U.S.-Australian relationship is how bipartisan it has been. The one thing that will cause mateship between Democrats and Republicans, and you've seen it in succession, successive engagement between uh, Americans and Australians, is their deep love and respect for Australia. And so there's very little that divides uh, Democrats and Republicans when it comes to an agenda for Australia. So I, I think in that respect, Australians can be comforted and can be relieved that, that uh, Biden administration will be um, a strong supporter of Australia. But the last thing I think that, that you will see, I mean, I, I don't know how we got in a situation where we have a chief executive who, who, who absolutely will under no circumstances apologize or take anything back and continues to take positions on a number of issues that are just antithetical to reality, to good sense, to, you know, just across the board. And I think America will be more recognizable. I think it will be more multicultural. I think you're likely to engage diplomats and others that will look more like America. Um, and uh, you will find uh, a number of issues that frankly, um, both the United States and Australia share in terms of what we want for our children and the, and the way ahead. So I'm deeply optimistic about US-Australian relations. I also think that both of us have come to some of the same res uh, uh, realizations about the challenges that China pose. And I think both of us realize that having a strong workable relationship with China is in our best interests. But the only way to get that, as Michelle indicated, is to get at it together and not just roll over and allow us to be divided. So I think the agenda is there for us. I think Australians will be pleased if Vice President Biden is elected. And I can assure you that the people around him have deep experience, knowledge, uh, and commitment to this relationship that has served us so well for decades. Thank you, Kurt, for ending on an optimistic note. I don't know if the audience could hear, but it seems like there's a thunderstorm in uh, Washington. It's just rolled through. Uh, it's just Washington. helicopters overhead, helicopters. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting it as thunderstorms, and we know that after the thunderstorms, there are clear skies. So uh, thank you for ending on a note of optimism, and I want to thank very warmly Michelle Flournoy and Kurt Campbell, two terrific friends of the Institute and of Australia, for being here this evening. Thank you very much. Uh, let me also thank everybody in the audience for joining us for this latest Lowy Institute live event. For the time being, we're live streaming all of our events, so please keep an eye on our website for future events. Also, keep an eye out for our podcasts, COVIDcast, and my own podcast, The Director's Chair, which is available on SoundCloud, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Today, we release the new episode of The Director's Chair, in which I speak with legendary Australian official, no doubt friend of Kurt's and Michelle's, Dennis Richardson, who has lots of interesting yarns, including about the time that Bob Hawke um, insisted on, uh, on um, testing who was taller between Dennis Richardson and Bob Hawke. So if you want a light touch, then please tune into that. Again, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and in particular, thank you very much, Kurt Campbell and Michelle Flournoy. Thank you and good evening. Good morning. You, All the best down under. Thank you very much. All right. Okay.